I wouldn't call what I'm doing new age. I wouldn't then know. It's as old as the Bible. Old age. <laughs> oh, no, it's old age. It's faith in health. When you are sick, every cell in your body is sick. You know, they always say that a person who is not cooperating too well makes the best cancer patient in the end <laughs> because they, they're fighting for their life. But what about in, in the, the, the toughest moments which you describe, the radiation, the weeks and months of radiation where you're being bombarded with poisons? Uh, how, what did you do to hold on to an image or to hope, for that matter? I, I did persist with my imaging, and my imaging, oddly enough, came through the Olympic Games that year. These gorgeous faces, you know, so young and so full of health and so wanting to win. And these just came through to me, and I wanted to win my life. Bone is who I am. Cancer took away all the irrelevancies and left me with what matters. On tonight's South Bank show, the man who's been called the best poet the English language has today, and who comes from and writes about the tropical island of St. Lucia. Hello, Robert Graves said he had a better command of the English language than any living writer. Joseph Brodsky has called him the best poet the English language has today. He's just won the Queen's Gold Medal for Poetry, an honour he shares with W.H. Auden and Philip Larkin. But Derek Walcott, who's the subject of tonight's programme, is comparatively unknown in Britain. Perhaps this is because he comes not from Britain or the United States, but from the tiny West Indian island of St Lucia. St Lucia is a dot on the map. It's only 27 miles long and 14 miles wide. It lies in the chain of Windward Isles that runs between the Caribbean and the Atlantic. Before it became independent 10 years ago, it changed hands between the British and French 14 times. So that it now has two languages. One is English, the other is a combination of French and West African, and that's called Creole or Patois. Derek Walcott grew up speaking English with a formidable education in English and European literature. But he came to use the forms of European literature to describe the unnamed New World. And at the heart of his work lies a number of divisions between English and the Creole, black and white, old world and new world, home and abroad. For like many of his countrymen, Derek Walcott has spent much of his adult life away from home. He now lives in Boston, where he teaches at the university. But he spends several months of every year on St. Lucia, his island, his home, and the subject of much of his poetry. No, no, no. Well, uh, not on the same road. In idle August, while the sea soft and leaves of brown islands stick to the rim of this Caribbean, I blow out the light by the dreamless face of Maria Concepcion to ship as a seaman on this Kuna flight. I smile to myself as the bow rope untied and the flight swings seaward. There's no use repeating that the sea have more fish. I want her dressed in the sexless light of a seraph. 
I want those round brown eyes like a mama's at. Until the day when I can lean back and laugh those claws that tickled my back on sweating Sunday afternoons like a crab on wet sand. As I worked, watching the rotting waves come past the bow that scissor the sea like silk, I swear to all you, by my mother's milk, by the stars that shall fly from tonight's furnace, that I love them, my children, my wife, my home. I love them as poets love the poetry that kills them, as drowned sailors the sea. ever look up from some lonely beach and see a far schooner? Well, when I write this poem, each phrase will be soaked in salt. I could draw and knot every line as tight as ropes in this rigging. In simple speech, my common language will be the wind, my pages the sails of the schooner flight. But let me tell you how this business began. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called each living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an helpmeet for him. I remember only one thing about my father who died when I was one, and it's, I think it's a hallucination. I remember a moment in my childhood in which I thought I saw him not defined, but at the foot of the stair. Uh, that's all I remember of him. And of course, this was not real, except it may have been a memory of an infant. Uh, but growing up at, at home, my mother, who was a school teacher, used to perform in amateur concerts that he would, evidently would have directed, and his friends. And she was a great reciter. She would recite Portia's speech and other poems and stuff. And then she had friends who were also actor, amateur actors and so on. So I grew up with the sound of my mother reciting these great speeches uh, because she'd played Portia. And I, I think very young, I wanted to write something that sounded, you know, good enough for her to want to recite, you know? I mean, way down there. Was this something you were actually conscious of doing at the time? In my father's absence, and she, she talked about him continually, um, I felt, both myself and my twin brother, uh, that what I wanted to do was to continue the sort of work that he'd done. We had emblems, you know, stuff of his around the house. We had paintings and reproductions that he'd copied of, you know, um, Millie's Gleaners and um, Turner's The Fighting Terraria and so on. They were, you know, all around. And then a couple of his own original watercolors. He was a very good painter. So I just felt from very young, you know, from nine on, that um, that's what I wanted to do. I knew from that age that that's what I wanted to do. Did you go about doing it from that age on? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I also had very encouraging teachers. Um, they'd make me, sometimes I recited in front of the school, you know, I'd show them my poems, and they were, they must have been young men of about 19 or 18, but they were uh, amazingly encouraging. What the cattle of St. Lucia? The cattle of St. Lucia. Castries is the capital of? Lucia. Lucia. It's a town or a country? It's a town. It's a city, yes. Boy, name the great harbors of the world. Sydney, sir. San Francisco. Naples, sir. And what about Castries? Sir, Castries is a calling station and the 27th best harbor in the world. In it, the entire British Navy can be hidden. What is the motto of St. Lucia, boy? Statio haud malefida carinis. Sir, sir. And what does that mean? Sir, a safe anchorage for ships. The experience of childhood I had as a British 
colonial was benign, very. It was even kind, in a sense. And this may sound like, you know, it comes a shock to people to say, well, this is how he talks because he's, you know, look at what he is now, cliche, whatever. But I think in my generation, I think the generation of writers, um, like Lamming and maybe Knight Paul, yes, I think what, what we went through was, um, for instance, the presence of the policeman on the street was a, an unarmed native policeman who had to be polite to you and so on. I mean, this is the English Bobby in the tropics. This is not the same thing as, say, the French Jardin in Martinique or the Latin American cop. This man, this native constable, embodied all the whatever was supposed to be, you know, proper, gentle, and disciplined in that empire, you know, to the point where, you know, as boys, we'd harass policemen and shout, shout at them, you know, and they, <laughs> they never chased us. They, you know, they just, I mean, that's a, a very ordinary symbol of things. But also in terms of the, um, and I think you couldn't separate, I, maybe I just could not separate my love of the English language from um, the sort of sunset, the benign beginning sunset of its empire. I'm quite aware of the brutalities. I'm quite aware of the, you know, I'm saying in my own actual experience in St. Lucia as a young West Indian, this was not, I never felt degraded by, um, you know, by colonialism. I know the facts of it. I know I could see what happened. My personal experience was not that. How would you more exactly locate yourself, as it were, on the island you grew up in? The freshness, the richness, you know, the cool, the whole feeling of the hills and the sea and stuff up in the country and around the town too, I mean, was something that was so, so very strong in me. I mean, you'd feel, I'd feel almost sometimes as if I'd choke from it sometimes, you know, as a child, because I just felt that I wanted to, to, to put it down a lot or to paint it. it. And it was a totally unnamed, totally virginal kind of landscape. Um, so I was very excited. I mean, I had a tremendous excitement in me from very young about wanting to, to put that down. About the August of my 14th year, I lost myself somewhere above a valley owned by a spinster farmer, my dead father's friend. At the hill's edge, there was a scarf with bushes and boulders stuck in its side. Afternoon light ripened the valley Rifling smoke climbed from small laborers' houses, and I dissolved into a trance. I was seized by a pity more profound than my young body could bear. I climbed with the laboring smoke. I drowned in laboring breakers of bright cloud. Then, uncontrollably, I began to weep inwardly, without tears, with a serene extinction of all sense. I felt compelled to kneel. I wept for nothing and for everything. I wept for the earth of the hill under my knees, for the grass, the pebbles, for the cooking smoke above the laborers' houses like a cry for unheard avalanches of white cloud. But darker grows the valley, more and more forgetting. For their lights still shine through the hovels like litmus. The smoking lamp still slowly says its prayer. The poor still move behind their tinted scrim. The taste of water is still shared everywhere. But in that ship of night locked in together, through which like chains a little light might leak, something still fastens us forever to the poor.
You began by being a painter, didn't you? Is that because it was easier to be an artist as a painter? Um, well, I didn't quite. I tried to do both. Uh, but there's a very big difference between somebody who can paint pretty well and somebody who's a painter. And I think it, I mean, my, I think my son is a painter much more than I am. And it's a simple thing about it's being in the wrist. It's something in the, it's how the paint is moved along, you know, um, recklessly, you know, without any kind of caution. Um, and although I can paint pretty competent watercolors, I just don't have that um, burst and confidence that one has in being, you know, somebody sloshing the paint around with a lot of, um, you know, I just, I don't slosh, I just sort of, <laughs> Pull, you know, it's all very Methodist. <laughs> the funny thing is, most people wait until after they've been robbed to put in their own security system. Everybody seems to think it's only for the rich. It's not. Everyone deserves peace of mind. A Voxcom security system can protect your family and your possessions, giving you peace of mind. Peace of mind comes from knowing someone is looking out for you. We protect and monitor Canadians from coast to coast. In the case of an emergency, we alert the proper response team, fire, police, ambulance, to exactly where and when they are needed. How much is peace of mind worth to you? Call from anywhere in Canada, toll free. Give your family a new sense of security starting today. Violence. Stop calling it bizarre. Something that's bizarre is not something that happens routinely. Watch Off the Page on Book Television, the channel. You decided to become a poet at a remarkably early age, and having decided to do that, um, was there a, a, a sort of artist's life that you led? as a young man? Oh, well, there wasn't a, um, you know, like a giving up of a job and doing that somewhere alone or something like that. Um, you know, one could write, and I, the job I had after I left college was teaching as a young assistant master in the college, um, which consisted of having to wear a tweed coat and a tie, you know, just as if you were in London, you know, and a tin of country life cigarettes if you were a young assistant master and so forth. Um, so there wasn't any sort of um, break from normalcy and going off and doing something. Um, although a friend of mine who I wrote about in Another Life has done that and did that, became a painter completely. Uh, so the, the, the direction was this usual one of, um, you know, leaving school, getting a job uh, as a teacher, and then going off to university in Jamaica. Uh, at some time much later, when I left university, and was first married, I decided that I was definitely going to stop, um, you know, anything else but paint. And then I got very, very afraid because I began to actually start a canvas and thought, wait a minute, if I'm going to make a living off this thing, I have to do about 200, you know what I mean, a month, you know, at so much a month, you know. Um, so, you know, that didn't work out. Okay, have to you? Wait, no, you, you lead because I don't. But Dawson, you had another. This is not the same studio you had, right? No, that's about the third or the fourth. Along with his school oh, friend, Dunstan St. Omar, who has since become a professional side. painter, Derek Walcott was taught to paint by a friend of his dead father, yeah. called Harry Simmons. Remember when Harry's up at um, Barnard Hill? Harry's studio? Yeah, man. That's our first studio. Yeah. Our earlier Pain studio. Painting on the veranda. Uh huh. All right. Was the name of that good Through painting with Harry Simmons, Walcott realized that he didn't need to depend on the European themes of the pictures and books he'd studied. His own landscape and his own people were also fit subjects. That must have been the first local good portrait of a black woman I ever saw. And with the native head, head yeah. tie, I remember? Right. He did a watercolor of it after for um, Michael Beaubrand. I can't remember that one. Yeah. I can remember the oils, eh? It's not the studio now. Yeah, that's... Is it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good. The harbour has changed a lot, eh? They've still got that cliff where they're still quarrying, you know? Uh -huh. So, I'm... Um, uh, but they were but the taller buildings, because they're like sort of gamboge and brick um, buildings with red roofs, so we used to look at... Like the military you know, hospital say, and yeah, so forth? Yeah, cool? you know, yeah. say it looked like Cezanne or, or part of um, an Italian painting. 
in the late afternoon. I think that is, that's, that's gone, no? Yeah. Or well, some of it is still there. More than anything, I think the main thing was that we saw when we went up to his studio, we saw paintings of St. Lucia, uh, watercolors of the beaches and the mountains. And then we saw paintings of people. I mean, these are black people. These were St. Lucian people. La trèfle est le pays en fond, 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 le pays en bas, 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 and you know you'd have a drink there and so on and the you got to know the country through that little kind of odyssey that you do around around it you know in in the most beautiful and sometimes very remote places you know so the paintings that he did and the um and the development of the affection and then the love and then the the confidence uh that seeing that kind of work uh, gave to, to Dunstan and myself was a tremendous thing because, I mean, it is un, you cannot possibly imagine the excitement <coughs> that would be there in, you know, going off into some part of St. Lucia <coughs> in a place that's never been painted before and just, <coughs> you know, trying to get it down, you know? I can remember the smell of the paint if we were painting together and the shape of, say, a breadfruit leaf, the richness of the green paint inside the outline and the smell of the oil, you know, painting in the open if you were doing that. And to me, it was almost the same thing I was trying to get. If I, if I wrote the word breadfruit, I was trying to get back of it. I mean, all whatever I had in my hand about what the color of the paint would be if I were using a brush rather than a pen. And to make it as... as um, you know, as tactile and as even to, if you could get the smell of it as well on the page, you know, that is, that's a tremendous amount of work and a tremendous amount of joy. In your verse, there are echoes of uh, many great poets. There's a canon of English literature there. There's Wordsworth and there's T.S. Eliot and Keats and Marvel and Dylan Thomas and Edward Thomas uh, and many others. You're working inside the tradition. Uh, were you very conscious of doing that? But I remember the Faber Orden and the Faber Elliot and stuff like that, you know. Um, and just the physical thing of holding these books um, and Thomas and so on. And what I used to do is almost every day or as often as I could, I had an exercise book or exercise books in which I would model uh, a poem directly onto, almost like a, you know, an overlay uh, down to the rhymes and the meter, you know, but out of my own... Um, background and family and, and landscape and so on. I didn't feel anything. Uh, it was just to me a complete apprenticeship, a, a complete surrender to modeling because I knew that I was in a landscape that didn't have pylons and, you know, and trains and, and autumn or whatever. Taking action is where things are going to happen. If you're sitting at home doing nothing, you're not going to get anywhere. Your dreams aren't going to come true. Very valuable. Very valuable. It made me feel great and it's how you feel and going forward wonderful. It was a great experience, definitely something that I would I would do again. This is your first step to taking action to making your dreams come true and I've done a lot of learning annex courses and all of them are the same. It's you know get out there and get going and just by taking those steps and taking the courses my dreams have started already to come true. Why just use Febreze on the dog bed? After all Let's lots go, of boys. everyday odors aren't as obvious, at least to you. <laughs> Clean away odors all over the house. And Febreze will leave a freshness you'll notice. It's 
Smells nice in here. The more you use it, the more you love it. Febreze. No kidding. Oh, I know what you mean. I'm going straight into a bubble bath myself. You want to make love to me? I have played the part before, you know. It was him. Have you recovered? Almost. I must talk to you. How dare you speak to me that way? Watch me now. <laughs> One critic writing in the New York Times, has said of Walcott's work, despite his superb command of English, he has never felt quite at home in it. The paradox of a colonial identity is that it both liberates and oppresses, offering freedom from a dominating tradition, yet robbing the poet of any natural claim on the language. Well, I think the difference lay not in a longing to see Adams and Oaks, really, the point was the alleged embarrassment, supposed embarrassment, the presumed disinheritance, the presumed inferiority of mangoes next to elms or palm trees next to eucalyptus or, or, or pines or something. That's a penalty that colonialism brings with it, that everything becomes uh, less than its alleged, you know, superior, it's an alleged original. Um, and that is what, the, that's the sort of distinction um, I was trying to make in terms of, of uh, not wishing that the climate were different, uh, but bega beginning to realize, and it's a very simple answer, it is simply that those things are named by the literature. Somebody in Warwickshire who says Elm, right, says Elm. But if Shakespeare says Elm, then that's, that's, a, that's a noble tree. The difference simply is that um, there was no articulating of that vegetation. It was not sanctified by, by literature or, or hallowed by that experience. But the people of my generation who were beginning to write about it, who hesitated on the fringe of writing down the word breadfruit, on the fringe of writing down the word mango, didn't mean that the mango was not a beautiful tree. It was that the penalty of colonialism was the mango couldn't possibly have the dignity of an oak uh, in the same way that a black West Indian could not have the po possibly have the dignity of an Englishman in Warwickshire. You know, it, that's a pe penalty of, of colonialism. This is the mango tree. And the, that one there is the sweet stuff. We eat it when it's ripe, we eat it. We pick it, we sell it, we make juice with it. All different kinds of things. And this one there, the nuts. the nuts, we roast them and we peel them up and we eat them. Sometimes we can even make um, juice with it and we eat it, we drink it. The coconut, when it's dry, we make, we make coconut balls, we make coconut oil, we make all different kinds of things. Mm. We always spoke two languages. It wasn't like I had to struggle to understand English. I mean, English was the language at home of all, our, all the college boys, um, except those who were very much poorer, maybe, and came from the country in which they might purely have been speaking French Creole. But it's a dual sharing. I mean, the you know, all the other languages, in, certainly in the towns, you know, was English, all right? Now, maybe that English is, of course, a broken English, so you have two dialects. You have a French-English dialect, right, deriving from both English and French, you have a Patois dialect deriving from French, you know? So you really, if you look at it, you've got three or four going to draw from, you know? Um, but in terms of, it's not a matter of my feeling, uh, you know, in any way it's different from, you know, my college experience, my, you know, my Methodist school experience that we were taught, you know, um, in English. And in fact, as a matter of fact, Creole would not have been used in the classrooms at all. It wasn't that it was punished, like happened to the English, the Welsh language, or the, you know, or the Irish language. Um, and of course, there was a sort of social scourge attached to it, but not in my house, not for my mother, you know? I mean, because, and you, would, you heard that sound around you. It was wonderful to hear it, you know? It's still great to hear it. Brother V. Ou descendre qui 
bon matin, non, là, même moi, je suis venu. Je suis en fond, il faut que ça veut dire pour y aller. Zandolé. The pineapple's Aztec helmet. Palm, I have forgotten what palm for the Irish potato. Suez, the cherry, Zamon, sea almonds, where the crisp sea bursts, or border of year. Come back to me, my language. Come back, caco, grigri, solitaire, ciseau, the scissor bird. No nightingales except once in the indigo mountains of Jamaica. Blue depth, deep as coffee, flicker of pimento, the shaft light on a yellow aki, the bark alone bare. Jardin en montagne, en habitation, the wet leather reek of the hill donkey. coast of St. Lucia and you know the, the villages are below the salt wind is blowing and you can hear the noise of the trees behind you and then noise in the village behind you. What, what you go through is like a surging, it's like a lifting. You feel so small that you feel so um, incapable of making the, the pages rustle if they could like the wind, or making the, the, the light come off the page as if it were light on a wall. You just want to do that because it's such a, such a celebration to do it, to convey it to someone else. I mean, that's I would say that's practically all my life has meant, really, to be able to do that, I think. Well, we use Bradaman, we use them, um, uh, they call it Poi and Balata. you know? Um, uh, you get in um, uh, red cedar, you get in blue maho, you get in white pine, what again? Uh, they have tick, you know? Akaju, they have uh, akukwa, you get in all them woods, you know? The furniture. They have one they call it Guape um, uh, The panel of sunrise on a hillside shop gave these stanzas their stilted shape. If my craft is blessed, if this hand is as accurate, as honest as their carpenters, every frame intent on its angles would echo the settlement of unpainted wood. As consonants scroll off my shaving plane, in the fragrant creole of their native grain. From a trestle bench they'd curl at my foot, 
Seas, ours with a French or West African root. From a dialect thronging its leaves, unread yet light on the tongue of their native road. But drawing towards my pegged out twine with beveled boards of unpainted pine. Like muttering shale, exhaling trees refresh memory with their smell. Boacano, Boacampeche, hissing, what you wish from us will never be. Your words is English, is a different tree. Hey guys, how would you like to turn up the heat and please your partner in delicious new ways? And girls, how would you like to drive your man to incredible new heights of pleasure? Now you can. It's all here in the critically acclaimed video, What Men and Women Really Want. This tastefully explicit 90-minute video leaves no stone unturned, no zone untouched, especially those of your lover. Chosen best video by Men's Health magazine, What Men and Women Really Want reveals how to take each other to erotic new heights undreamed of before. Due to its mature content, we're unable to show you more, but watch it together. together. And your intimate encounters will never be the same again. For the pleasure that awaits you, call 1-800-464-0167 or send $29.95 plus $4.95 shipping to Best Video at the address on your screen. Winnie the Pooh, I have to say. I have to say. There's a lot of hidden messages in Winnie the Pooh. But I'm the book, sure there is. <laughs> but the book I just read is uh, My Dear Boy, The Life of Keith Moon. Right. Which was um, which was really good actually. It kind of dispelled a lot of the myths and told the truth about, you know, um, what he really got up to. It's really interesting. Oh, and cool. the other one was Losing My Virginity, which is about the rise of the Virgin Empire, which is very interesting. Yeah. And his battle with British Airways, which is great. customs here. The dead are different. Different shells guard their graves. They are distinctions beyond the paradise of our horizon. This is not the grape purple Aegean. There is no wine here, no cheese. The almonds are green, the sea grapes bitter, the language is that of slaves. I've never tried to just paint it in this sort of postcard way or some, you know, phony uh, pastoral vision because, I mean, the poverty was too strong, the, the disease around you and so on, and, you know, the smell of the drains and so on. I've never tried to leave that out, you know, 
or the struggle or the poverty and so on. So I've never, I've never just tried to paint a kind of, you know, Whitman as pastoral of some huge um, dream and so on. What do you have to say about the Caribbean as a place of corruption, inertia, a place to wring your hands over as uh, V.S. Naipaul does? You satirize him in a poem called Spoiler's Return as V.S. Nightfall. Right, yes, yes. What about that uh, point of view? I don't have that sense of despair. I mean, how, how much lower can you go than slavery, do you know? Uh, so unless you can find something that is, you know, worse than slavery, which is hard to imagine, uh, because situ slavery is a nameless, anonymous, hopeless condition, which you're deprived of everything, your name, your, you know, your family, your country. Um, that is not so in the Caribbean. Quite the opposite is happening. I think a claiming is happening that is there in the younger writers. I don't, they're not bothered now about whether they should go to London or whether they should recognize by as X or Y by, you know, some metropolitan authority. Quite the opposite is happening. You can't use the same terms to apply to, you know, someone in Athens or in the Middle East as you would to the Caribbean, simply because the history does not have those references. But you see, that, I think, is also the strength of the Caribbean, that physically even, if a slave had to cross in the whole of the Atlantic and stand up, you know, after thousands of miles on a beach, that's a very strong specimen of an African. And that is true mentally, spiritually, the, the effort required to, to let your land go back behind you and to start again um, does not make the Caribbean uh, races, you know, groups of degraded people. It makes them extremely strong. I mean, it makes them physically strong. Otherwise, you know, the, those who are sick were at the bottom of the ocean. Before he went back to St. Lucia for the summer, Derek Walcott began working on a new novel-length poem which looks at the Homeric myth of Hector and Achilles in terms of the lives of a group of modern St. Lucian fisherman. Well, right now I'm working on something that's tentatively titled either Homeros or Omeros, which is a Greek name for Homer. Um, but part of it, I think, came from the idea that uh, when you anglicize something, you lose a lot. You know, I mean, Homer and Virgil sound like two New England farmers, you know. And, I knew this Greek girl who laughed when I said the name Homer, and she said, you know, that's not his name. And I think the whole part of it is, that's not his name, um, you know, is part of the theme of the thing. And one of the characters in it is a man called Achille, which, of course, that's not his name, because he's an African, a St. Lucian, fisherman. Um, and although I don't deal with what his original name must have been, I think, thematically, it is going to be that he is an Achilles, in a sense, that he is a warrior, his, except his arena is the sea. This was how, in green sunrise, they chose the canoes. On a cold ridge, as the hazed sea was waking, they stood in dewy ferns. Now their gaze follows the mass of mossy trunks, the top leaves shaking in windy light, like the noise of emerald shallows with that identical noise. Also the slow creaking branches creak like the screech of pulleys, so that the running hills, the fog-thinned valleys, what are these fishermen extensions of the sea's early sound? And they saw the wind 
agreeing with their rooted judgment, the axes in their eyes that had already hacked and trimmed the cedars. Columns are brought down and towering cultures from the root, from the speckled blight at the base of Troy. The way those cedars slowly leaned towards the ferns with a long sideways groan, leaving a space for the new sky where no sky was before. Well, let me see Maxime. All this whole business of crossing the world and coming to these small bits of, you know, an archipelago, um, in which some places are recreated, in a sense. Uh, I'm sure there must be, uh, even in a legendary sense, a reflection of Africa, certainly in, in the details of a lot of things, quite apart from the language and the way of life and, you know, certain courtesies and certain very simple things that are there. Um, so that in a sense, this archipelago is, in a way, a mirror of the one on the other side, um, you know, the, the inland sea and the, the rhythm of the sea, I think, particularly in small islands, um, even perhaps imperceptibly on a large island, has something to do with the interior rhythm of, of, um, of people. The activity of fishing becomes more than um, a simple activity. It, to me, in a way, it becomes something legendary. Hector was there, Theophile also. In this light, they have only single names. Placide, Bobot, Felice, Papanon, Maljo, Achille, and Patroc. As they took up the spatulate lances of oars and set them parallel in the empty gunwales over the fresh bilge under the rowing planks, then returned together with this identical stride, except for Philoctet, who limped with a bad foot with the same incurable sore that he believed the sea salt would cure. They unhooked the nets that had grown sleepier with the dew, the lines of the nylon, bottle green, fading purple, as if a hand had stained them with a wine dye, then carried the nets groaning to the gunwales and piled them apart from the oars, then stood resting from the wet weight, while Philoctet soothed his infected shin, cawed like a coral where a backwash caught him with an anchor's hook. They passed round the white room, be white. It was time to work. Philoctet watched them. They spat. The sun spread on their faces, moving towards the canoes. There is an inevitability of narrative, I think, in any Caribbean writer, simply because the story, our stories, have not been told. Whatever the attitude, you know, embittered or whatever, you know, sentimental, whatever the reason may be. But I think that instinct for narrative has a lot, to, it, this may sound very, very <laughs> silly, but I think it has a lot to do with space and the relationship to time. Um, I think the undertaking of narrative has got to do with the rhythm of a people's living. I think if you lived in London and you, and you undertook narrative poetry, uh, it wouldn't go further down the block unless you understood perhaps some historical, you wanted to do something historical about historical England anyway. Um, so that the idea of history and in, in terms of the location of space, where we are in terms of time and space, 
and the fact that utterance hasn't really happened, um, it's been happening recently in the Caribbean, not because we are in an inarticulate people, but simply because slaves weren't allowed to write novels, do you know what I mean? In their days, do you know what I mean? And there weren't books, there still aren't, there are very few print readers and so on. So, and since slavery is just barely 150 years old, um, or indenture later even, it's very recent, and it's not, not at all startling that there should be an outburst of people wishing to tell their own, you know, experiences um, autobiographically. There's a strong sense of autobiography in the West Indian novel, um, not from vanity, I think, simply because of some trend of understanding, of, an understanding of some ethnic relationship, particularly, to where people are. Have you noticed your hair is changing? I like having long hair. However, over the years, I've noticed it's been losing its body and vitality. Then I discovered Inner Science. Inner Science, the hair care system proven to rejuvenate the look of your hair. Like your skin, your hair changes over time. Inner Science is rich in amino acids. It restores the look of youthful vitality. It feels great. It feels totally rejuvenated. I wear my hair loose, and people say I should do it more often. The science of inner science takes years off the look of your hair. distinguished author, and I speak like a child. I write this on a horned island to the sound of the morning surf of wind on a sea of grass, from a girl's mouth whispering like reeds in sand. These men become letters, figures circling a vase. Their limbs are shone with crushed, legendary oils. Their lives are taken down from museum shelves. Their praise is carried in the white clay of her voice, the way a shell carries the ocean as it exhales at the air's shell, not Homer, but Omaros. And I heard the hollowing moan, not of high ships setting out with iron captains, but only the prose of abrupt fishermen as they rolled their canoes. <laughs> It's not that these islands are like very close to any mainland. There's an enormous width of sea between, say, um, Central America and, you know, and Martinique. I mean, it's a vast area. It isn't something that's safe. I mean, they are going out into a huge element in which they have been, you know, disasters. <laughs> Oh, it's a, it's a little of you. If you want to come to you, the little one can pass about. The open detail, but I want to go to the little one. The little one can go to the little one. The little one can go to the little one. The little one can go to the little one. The little one can go to the little one. I mean, I know who's in it. I almost have a shape of the first book. It's not modeled on the Odyssey or the Iliad. And the names of um, the Africans who are given heroic names, uh, 
you know, sometimes in a servile sense, sometimes out of, you know, patronage or out of admiration sometimes, whether somebody's called Pompey as a slave or someone is called Achille or someone is called Caesar or something. Um, I don't think these names are purely names given contemptibly by, you know, slave owners. I think the qualities in those slaves um, that the owner recognized and ascribe those qualities to to the slave. So that an Achille, to me, it would be not a phenomenon if he were a very, um, you know, whatever qualities Achilles had or Hector would have. <laughs> Mark Hillman had the oldest rum shop in the village. It had an old upstairs balcony. Ten yards from it, Hector fell, staring past its wooden tables. Then he roared in the footsteps of sulking Achilles, baiting his shadow until it entered the leopard shade of an old almond and sat in his legendary rage beyond noon watching the sand widen from the sea's withdrawal. Surf fingers smoothed out the page where their names were written. If Achille came forward and fell for the hectoring, Quapon, Vienneg, coward. If Achille sharpened a cutlass for Hector's head, for a while, near the nets, the villagers gathered, then left the bent shadow under the almond to read the fate it sketched in sand. And then Achille stood. Then Hector came back. And this time, Hector had more than a stone. And why these men quarreled until one of their trunks branched into blood Nobody remembers, but all said they understood. There are many who claim the same for the Iliad. Well, I think the biggest problem for me, it always remain, is how honest I am, not in terms of uh, my own feeling, but whether I magnify something into a kind of glory that it does not deserve. You know, and I'm here again for two days and I've been bothered about it. And this morning when I was swimming, I thought, okay, this is fine. If I went further in to the sea and really went into the sea, and if I got aboard a canoe and was going out and the island receded till there was nothing but a little, you know, hump on the horizon, I would be in the center of an immensity that is bound to bring some kind of awe. I have only one theme. The bowsprit, the arrow, the longing, the lunging heart. The flight to a target whose aim we'll never know. Vain search for one island that heals with its harbor and a guiltless horizon. Where the almond shadow doesn't injure the sand. There are so many islands. As many islands as the stars at night. Sometimes it's just me in the soft scissored foam as the deck turn white and the moon open a cloud like a door and the light over me is a road in white moonlight taking me home. Shabin sang to you from the depths of the sea. Oh. 